Well, tonight is our last series, last lecture in this series. When we started this series, it was cold, wet, and damp outside. And I thought, well, how fitting when I got up this morning, it was cold, wet, damp, and blowing snow. I was like, we've just come full circle. We started in the cold and we're ending in the cold and we had every season in the middle. Oh, there. But we're very excited that every region, so I will ask everyone to please mute themselves. Feel free to leave your camera on or off. That is up to you. But if you have not muted yourself, I will mute yourself. I will mute you. If you have any questions during the program, please put them at the chat box at the bottom of the page, and I will share them with Fred. If Fred is able to answer them at that point, he will. If not, we'll hold them to the end when we do the questions and the answers. And so without further ado, we will begin the last session of our spring 2021 lecture series. And I wanna ask everyone, in April of 2020, how many of you were so Zoom proficient that you could have done this? And here we are, all old pros at it. So I'd like everyone to please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's series sponsor is Lorraine F. Birch and the Fred H. Birch Jr. Foundation, a West Michigan couple who believes in service to their community. And they believe that this happens through education. They believe not only in having service at the local level, they believe it also at the state and the federal level. They are a wonderful couple that dedicated their entire lives to this. They met during World War II and through their children, they have brought this through and begun this foundation. And we thank them for being our series supporter for this entire spring 2021 series, as well as our fall 2020 series. And we thank them. Our media sponsor for this evening is Blue Lake Public Radio. And we'd like to thank the year to be able to bring our information to you in such a wonderful way. Joining us tonight is one of their members. And so Paul, thank you for doing this. We appreciate that. And thank you to Blue Lake. And may we all have a wonderful summer coming up this year. Speaking of summer, it is hard to imagine, but the museum is ongoing and we have been open since last June of 2020. And we have been open each and every day following all the rules and regulations set out for us by the Health and Human Services Departments and we've done it successfully. This summer, we will continue to offer tours of the vessel. Again, we will probably not be able to give the guided tours, but we do have a wonderful video that is playing. We give you a booklet, we let you self-explore, and then please, we always ask that if you have any questions, you come back in and you ask us because there's nothing more fun than for something good at it. So we're waiting for people to come back and stump us. We have several things going on at the museum this summer that are a little bit different. We've expanded our lecture series to include summer. In the past, we have done a spring lecture series and a fall lecture series. This summer, we are doing one that's called Petron's Peer View. We chose this topic because it's going to be of topics that are of interest to the veterans and family members of the veterans. We have coming forward this summer, we're going to have someone talk about TRICARE. We're going to have someone talk about that is a veteran that has become a very successful entrepreneur. We have another veteran that has also gone into movie making and has written several best-selling books. We have a group coming out to talk about treating PTSD through horseback riding and through sailing. We have a whole series of topics. Those will be Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., excuse me, Wednesday mornings at noon, and they'll be meeting at the museum. 
As it stands right now, we should be able to have them indoors, but we also have acquired a 20 by 40 foot tent. And if we are not able to meet indoors, we will be meeting outdoors in our 20 by 40 foot tent, which we will have completely set up with audio visual equipment and ready to go for that. And we're just looking for an incredible summer. In addition to our new series, we're going to continue with our summer film series, which has been popular for the last few years. They are shown every afternoon at two o'clock in the afternoon, and we change the video once every week. This summer, we are going to be having the best military battle films, and that should be very exciting. Our fall lecture series is all set and ready to go as well. It begins the Monday after Labor Day, and it will be on Vietnam. We had started this lecture series in the spring of 2020, but then because of the shutdown, we were not able to complete it. So we have gone back and we have topped our list that we had before, and we are bringing back in some of those same speakers that we had and adding some new ones to it. And we're just very exciting. We're hoping that by the fall, we'll be able to be back inside the museum and we'll start out, if we need be, out in our tent outside. We will also continue to live stream and put them on Zoom so that everyone can attend um, across the country as well as being local. And we are very excited about that. Tonight's lecture, and I can't believe we're on lecture 10. I don't know where all the spring has gone to. It's called Terror on American Soil, September 11th, 2001. Right before the program started, just before I let everyone in, Teresa and our speaker, Fred Johnson, and I were all talking about where we were on that day. It is one of those days in history that you will always remember, and everyone has their own personal stories about it. And it's so fresh in our memory. But it's 20 years ago already. Um, it doesn't seem absolutely possible at all that that could have happened. And everything that we've discussed from our post-Vietnam era, where we started this lecture series, to now has all been building on this one climatic event. And it changed the way that we as Americans think about our world. And it's very, very interesting to look at how much our world has changed because of this. And so... Without further ado, I will introduce you to tonight's speaker, Dr. Fred Johnson. We are thrilled that he has been here with us for most of this series and that Ron Janowski had come in and spoken to us as well. His knowledge on these subjects has been incredible. His ability to put them together in manners that we can all understand and follow have made it clear how there's been a pathway that has gone and how American policy, how they Well, Silverside Scholars, it looks like Peg is, uh, the internet is and frozen up. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. And please mute yourself or else I will mute you. Good evening and welcome to the final session of our series on the last of the gatekeepers for the spring series. Thank you, Peg, for that wonderful introduction. I'm, I have done a screen share. Let's just go ahead and get right into what we're talking about for this evening. For the Twin Towers to Justice, the last of the gatekeepers. Now, Remember when we started, we said that they let this last of the gatekeepers, I was talking about generations of men and women, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, uh, everybody who's been involved in helping to defend the United States, first during the Cold War, from the end of World War II up until 1989, 1990, and then during those tough years after Vietnam, and then finally into what became known now as the War on Terror, although it wasn't called that initially, but it eventually became a war on terror, particularly with the advent of what we're talking about tonight. Let's pick it up from something I was talking about just last week in our last session. You know, if you go back and connect the dots, and I know it's always easier to do it in hindsight. What do they say? 
20, hindsight is 2020. You see things that you didn't see before because you have the, the advantage of what? Context and more information. But if you go back and connect those dots, it's not a question of how did the World Trade Center attacks on 9-11 occur? It's a question of how could they not have occurred given the run up to those events? Let's pick it up from here, February 26, 1993, 1218 Eastern time. On that date at that time, 1218 Eastern time on February 26, 1993, in the city of New York, in the United States, Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, for a number of years living in the city of Brooklyn, had been openly preaching against the United States, the West, and capitalism, and one that was basically advocating for a global a global campaign of terror against the United States, Western Europe, and, and the, the NATO allies for a whole range of, of ills, alleged ills and, and wrongdoings that he accused of the United States of. But in any case, Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, from this February 8, 2017 article in the Washington Post by Matt Scudel, bear with me as I read. Among other actions, Abdel Rahman was accused of plotting a day of terror in which simultaneous bombs will blow up the United Nations, the Lincoln and Holland Tunnels in New York City, the George Washington Bridge, and the building house in New York's FBI headquarters. All I know, he said, is that I have done nothing to do, I said, I have nothing to do with this case other than that I am a cleric who prayed in a mosque. Abdul Rahman said during his 1995 trial in federal court in New York. I did not speak, I did not give orders, I had nothing to do with anything. That's what he said during his 1995 trial. Well, okay, that's 1995, but we have to ask the question, what is he doing on trial in 1995? Well, it has to do with a lot of what happened in 1993. In 1993, there was an attempt to blow up the World Trade Center by a truck bomb the whole idea was to collapse the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers, from below. And they did it by truck bomb. And it caught the nation's attention for obvious reasons. The World Trade Center, two magnificent architectural structures, the center of American finance and financial power, symbol of New York's prominence as an American city. And the person who they traced this, the mastermind for the plot of the World Trade Center 1993 attack was Ramzi Youssef, who masterminded that 1993 attack. Now, if you look at that attack, and then consider that on June 25th, 1996, just three short years later, in Saudi Arabia, now it's several years after the, after the first Gulf War, I re recall that we said that Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait in the, the early 1990s, and that led, to a, that led to an operation called Operation Desert Shield, which to keep it simple, was basically just a buildup of American troops and supplies into the Middle East to begin the possibility of military operations to get Saddam Hussein out of that area. And again, Ron Jankowski gave a wonderful presentation on both operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. But after Operation Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm, the Air Force was tasked to provide some overwatch responsibilities in that region. Basically, Operation Southern Watch, which was basically to make sure that the Iraqi Air Force stayed grounded. A northern and southern no-fly zone was imposed. And if you take a look at the map, to the north of Iraq, there was the nation of Turkey. To the south of Iraq was the nation of Saudi Arabia, neither of which had a whole lot of love for the Iraqi people or for not so much for the Iraqi people, but definitely not for Saddam Hussein. To the east, there was Iran. The thing about Iran and Iraq is this, Iran is primarily a nation of Shiite Muslims. The dominant religious sect in Iraq is not only, but definitely Sunni. Now Saddam Hussein fashioned himself to be a secular leader. Shiite and Sunni Muslims do not always get along together. So you have a tremendous enemy in Iraq, in Iran to the east, not to mention that the Iraqis and the Iranians had fought a brutal war in the night in, before the, the, the first Gulf War. Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Turkey to the west 
and to the Southwest, we're not necessarily on friendly terms with Iraq either. So Saddam Hussein, when you, when you look at the Northern fly, fly Zone and the Southern No-Fly Zone, plus the geographic realities of all the enemies surrounding them, Saddam Hussein was basically reduced to being the mayor of Baghdad. But the whole idea of Operation Southern Watch was to keep the Iraqi Air Force grounded. Well, to do that, you gotta have aircraft. And to do that, you need people on station or in the area to keep those aircraft you know, looked after, maintenance done on those aircraft. You have ground personnel to support the people flying the aircraft. Enter Kobar Towers. Let me go back one. Kobar Towers was an area in Saudi Arabia where American Air Force personnel were staying. Kobar Towers in 1996 was targeted by a truck bomb as shown here by this diagram or this illustration. June 25th, 1996, a truck bomb that blew up and sheared off entire faces of buildings. And this was clearly an attack upon American Air Force and military personnel. Now, the World Trade Center attack in 1993, Kobar Towers, 1996. And the destruction of Kobar Towers, there was a lot, there was a loss of American life, obviously, there had to be. And then they tracked down and found the four alleged culprits, the four most wanted terrorists sought in connection with the bombing of the Kobar military complex in Dharan, Saudi Arabia on June 25th, 1996. Then after that, a little bit more here, you see here from this illustration, the 1996 car bombing of Kobar Towers. The Kobar Towers provided housing for American military station in Saudi Arabia, 19 Americans killed and hundreds injured linked to Al Qaeda operatives. Now, it, consider that in 1996, the, 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 the word or the phrase Al Qaeda is becoming more and more commonplace in American circles, certainly among American intelligence personnel. And then you get to 1998. In 1998, if you move to the continent of Africa, particularly the Horn of Africa, and specifically East Africa, East Africa is comp comprised of Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. That's East Africa as defined by people in East Africa, not by Americans, the way we like to sit up and cut things into quarters. So East Africa in Africa, East Africa, according to the East Africans, is made, made up of Kenya, Uganda, the, what they call the Great Lakes regions. On, in 1998, in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, the capitals respectively of Kenya and, Dar and, and Tanzania, within moments of each other, two bombs went off at the American embassy in Nairobi and at the American embassy in Dar es Salaam, within moments of each other. Now what I have here primarily are showing the pictures of the damage that occurred in Nairobi. And I mentioned to you all the last time that a few years after this, in the early 2000s, I actually visited this site of the embassy attack and it was still a lot of cleanup to do. I mean, I didn't end up going to Kenya until the early 2000s. So you're talking about two or three years after this attack took, took place and they were still cleaning up the wreckage. The glass that blew out, I talked to Kenyans over there and they said the glass that blew out of the building, just like shards of glass going everywhere, just scratching people, tearing people's skin, it was horrific. And this occurred, as I mentioned, within moments of each other, in two different capitals, in two different nations, both targets American embassies. It was not, it was impossible, impossible to conclude anything other than the fact that a war was being waged on America, an undeclared war, but a war nonetheless. You can see here the Kenyan people who are removing their dead and their wounded, and the thing about this is that the Kenyan people, there are beautiful people. They have been a long-standing American ally. The Port of Mombasa is a very, very valuable and strategically important and tactically important naval port for the US Navy and the Indian Ocean, for Indian operations, for deploying to other areas of that part of the world to interdict uh, pirates and a whole range of other things that go on for American interests and for the interests of our allies. And then, as they do so often, they track down the individuals responsible for that 
twin embassy attack and the hunt went on globally. Then in early 2000, October 12, 2000, now we're in the 21st century, literally the 21st century is here. And the USS Cole, an American warship stationed in Yemen, Yemen, that nation that we used to be North and South Yemen during the Cold War, the nation of Yemen today was called North and South Yemen. Again, another one of those divisions like North and South Korea, North and South Vietnam, North and South Yemen, and another one of those geographic oddities from the Cold War. In 2000, October 12th, a small boat carrying explosives as shown by this diagram, came straight toward the USS Cole and blew a hole in the side of it. Several American sailors lost their lives. And then of course, all of these things from 1993, the World Trade Center attacked the first time. 1996, Kobar Tower, Saudi Arabia. 1998, the twin embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. 2000, the attack on USS Cole. All these events, all these activities, all these attacks sponsored by, masterminded by, supported by, caused by Al Qaeda. And the operative behind Al Qaeda, the one that had been hiding out in Afghanistan, after the Soviets left the, after the Soviet after the Soviet Union left Afghanistan in the late '80s, and began to move into and, and move back into Russia, and Afghanistan descended into civil war, and the civil war chaos in Afghanistan provided an opening for the monster Osama bin Laden to move in there, set up shop, and begin training terrorists and terrorists and, and hatching terrorist plots. One of which, many of which all of which primarily were attacking Americans allies. And then there came September 11th, 2001. Now, Peg, Peg mentioned to you all in the introduction that 9-11 is one of those days, wherever you were, whatever you were doing, for a moment, things were frozen in time. When I was growing up, I remember my parents and my elders talking about they were able to remember exactly what they were doing on November 22nd, 1963, when they got the news that President John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. It was a different time and a different place. And Americans of that period, we had just come out of World War II. We were at the top of our game as much as we could be, at the, at, even at that stage of the Cold War. You had a young American president, his beautiful wife, American power, American economy seemed to be going well. You know, we were starting to get, get involved in Vietnam. It was not nearly as the tragedy that it became. And we definitely were on the, on the march thinking that we were doing the right thing. It was, you know, communism versus freedom. What could go wrong? Then there was this assassination and the whole world in the United States especially had to catch its breath and say, okay, what does this mean? People to this day can remember what they were doing on November 22nd, 1963, likewise, I don't know about you all, but I know exactly what I was doing on September 11th, 2001. I was in a foreign policy class, ironically of all things, at Hope College. The class started at about nine o'clock, 9.30. I remember I came downstairs in Lubbers Hall at, on the Hope College campus. I walked into my classroom and my students were sitting there. They heard about it before I did. I walked in and they all were sitting there with eyes as wide and big as grapefruits. Some of them had tears coming down their eye, coming down their cheeks. I said, what is the wrong? I mean, I said, okay, I know that. Sometimes I get terrible lectures, but you're gonna start, you at least have to wait to start crying you know, after I start talking. And they said, well, we think America's under attack. I said, stop playing. This is a foreign policy class. So that kind of thing, you know, I mean, maybe under uh, other circumstances, but this isn't funny. They said, no, no, we think we're under attack. There was a building across the street in Cook Hall. They had a very big screen TV, so I just, said, let's go across the street and take a look. And for the next hour and a half of the class, we sat there with our eyes wide and our mouths open as you watched planes flying into the World Trade Center. It was unbelievable to see commercial aircraft being used as flying bombs. We know that this happened during World War II when the Japanese turned airplanes into flying bombs called kamikazes, but commercial airliners, in the space of that morning, we had to rearrange our entire understanding of what it meant to go to war and what it meant to be on a commercial airliner. Well, those planes captured the world's attention and just like Americans had to figure out what was going on, 
so too did the world. You know, a lot of people have made a great deal of, of hey, about President George W. Bush's look of stun on his face that morning when his chief of staff, Andy Card, made the decision to tell him a second plane has hit the towers. America's under attack. People have said that the president should have responded a lot faster. Friends, can I just share with you that the look on President Bush's face that he has right there as depicted in this picture is exactly what it should have been. When you're the president of the United States, and you're being told that the World Trade Center is under attack, that planes, commercial airliners are being flown into it. That's not the kind of thing you expect to hear. So the look of stun on his face is a look of stun that we all had and shared. So let's give the president a break. The good news is that he recovered very quickly and then brought the news to the American people. Let me share this with you. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat, but they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. They can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundations of America. What was the president talking about that day? Well, earlier that day, these are the scenes that people had confronting them, and they still, even to this day, are hard to imagine. United 93, Cleveland, if you hear the sound right now. I got that big dog. You have a ball for turned to be a busy day, then it turned out to be an even busier year. We remember the scenes of people in the World Trade Center and the Twin Towers. They couldn't go down. They couldn't go up. They jumped from the building. On that day, as planes flew into the World Trade Center, 3,000 Americans would lose their lives. And the buildings would come tumbling down. It would be our generation's Pearl Harbor. The thing that let us know that wherever we thought we were, whatever our position was in the world, that whether we wanted war or not, whether you like war or not, war came to us. And the only thing that a nation can do when it's attacked 
is to respond. And the president responded. The political cartoons in the days and weeks after tell the story of their own. Political cartoonists are some of my favorite people because, you know, they, and through art, they get right to the heart of the matter. And they always seem to sum up the essence, the truth of what's going on in a given moment. And likewise, we learned that in addition to our wonderful women and men in uniform, there were fire and policemen and women who we now call first responders. They always have been first responders. And you know, the, our, our folks in uniform, our firemen and our firewomen and our police women and policemen, especially people in law enforcement have gotten a pretty tough rap over the last few years. And it's important that we need to remember that they need our support. They need our support and to be encouraged because they're doing a tough job and they're doing it for us. And just as if anybody can read something, you should thank a teacher. And if you can read it without being sent to jail, thank a soldier. Likewise, if you can walk the street at night and you feel rather kind of protected, then thank a policeman or policewoman. You have good fire, thank a fireman, a firewoman. The images were so moving in the weeks afterward, like these firemen getting to heaven because so many of them lost their lives in the attempt trying to rescue other people. And some of them were crushed beneath all the rubble when the Twin Towers came crashing down. And then of course there were the calls like, remember what well, so maybe some of you do remember, but right at the Pearl Harbor, there was the, the, the phrase, remember Pearl Harbor. It came, became the rallying cry for an entire nation. Likewise, never forget 9-11. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to the memorial in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, off of the Pennsylvania Turnpike, where United Flight 93 crashed, where the, the beautiful story of beautifully tragic story of American passengers on board that aircraft who figured out that that plane was being hijacked that morning. So they basically rushed the hijackers, took over the aircraft or tried to take over the aircraft and it crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. I visited Shanksville just over a year ago, right before the pandemic forced us all to shut down. And I gotta tell you, I was gonna put a lot of pictures in there to show you how beautiful it is out there, the memorial but I had just a few because I want to encourage you all to go. It's beautiful Pennsylvania countryside. And when you read some of the markers and some of the signs, the historical markers about how the planes came rumbling over people's homes that morning at zero altitude, shaking cups and dishes off the wall or out of cabinets and how people were awakened and rattled out of their minds and scared. And then all of a sudden there was a big crash and then nothing. Get on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, travel east to Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and visit the United 93 Memorial. There's also a film called United 93 that you can either stream or buy the DVD. United 93, watch that film. It is about as accurate a depiction as, you, as they can, they're able to gather based on radio transmissions, logs, reports everything from that morning, and it shows the heroism of these American civilians who got on that plane that morning as just regular passengers and flight attendants before the day was over, they had turned into people who probably saved a number of different lives. So yeah, we're going to remember. But after the remembering, there came the response. Time to do something. And we, by the time, it didn't take too long to figure out that Osama bin Laden was behind the attacks. And so President George W. Bush, of course, launched a campaign, the global war on terror to go after bin Laden. That eventually led us to go back into Iraq in 2003, Operation Iraqi Freedom. And people still debate, you know, whether or not uh, Saddam Hussein, the general consensus is that Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11, but so, uh, Iraq was seen as being a, 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 a nation that still was causing trouble. So we went to war with Iraq. And then after President Bush's terms in office, Barack Obama came into office, elected in 2008, sworn in in January 2009, and the hunt for bin Laden became his responsibility. And there was a man named Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti 
who was Osama bin Laden's courier. The CIA had known for a number of years or for a good long, long while that this man had a direct connection somehow or another, a direct connection to Osama bin Laden and that Osama bin Laden was hiding out in a compound in Abbottabad. So an operation was launched with Navy SEALs and Special Forces, some of the best of our best, to go and get bin Laden. There's another film entitled, I'll show you in just a minute, Old Dark, Zero Dark Thirty is the name of the film. And it is about, it is a dramatization. Now let me say this, United 93, Zero Dark Thirty, Hollywood's first duty to Hollywood is to entertain people. So even if it's a serious subject like this, Hollywood is still in the business of making films for entertainment. So understand there's always inaccuracies, but it is a good depiction. I use films in my classes to give students an idea of what it must have been like. So we have these special operations people, some of the best of our best, who are in the search for bin Laden, and they went after him. The United States was going to make good on President Bush's promise to get that justice. And here you see President Obama, then at the time, Vice President Joe Biden, Leon Panetta, and Hillary Clinton all around the table in the Situation Room at the White House. And as I mentioned in the, mil in the film Zero Dark Thirty, it gives a dramatization of how the helicopters took off. And while they were on the, on the way to Abbottabad to carry out their mission, these photos taken from the Situation Room, you see Robert Clark there, a national security specialist, all these people looking at the screen and following the blow by blow, moment by moment movements of the Special Operations Forces. As the helicopters landed, the Special Ops people deployed and they moved. Those things that on their helmets are called NODs, night observation devices or nods. They got inside the compound eventually. And again, Zero Dark Thirty does a wonderful, wonderful representation of the events as they took place. There were mishaps on the operation. You'll recall that during our series, our series we talked about Operation Eagle Claw, the attempt to rescue the American hostages from Tehran. That did not go well at all. Some of you may remember an operation for an attempt to American rescue American POWs during Vietnam called the Sante Raid. It went flawlessly, except for the fact that the Vietnamese moved the American prisoners before they could get there. So these kind of operations always have the risk of things going wrong and sometimes blowing up altogether. But on this particular operation, on this particular raid, to get inside of the compound in Abbottabad, they penetrated the compound, they got inside the building, and they eventually got Obama, or rather they got Osama. Bin Laden. And the key to letting them know that they had accomplished the mission was Geronimo E. KIA, May 1st, 2011. Geronimo E. KIA, Geronimo being the primary target, KIA killed in action. And of course it made worldwide news. How could it not? The guy who was behind the World Trade Center bombing, the guy who supposedly would bring America to its knees, the guy who had humbled America, the guy who had, who had, who had made America had bleed. If there's any upside to the lessons of what we learned in Vietnam is that we learned what it was to be humiliated. We learned what it was to bleed. We knew we learned what it was when people try to bring you to your knees. But fortunately, our people in our defense establishment also had a memory that goes all the way back 
to the 1930s. We also remember what happens when you do not stand up to tyrants and international bullies. That when you have people like Benito Mussolini, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, that it's not a question of will you fight these people, it's a question of when you fight them. Because those kind of people are not necessarily interested in peace, they're interested only in having their way and having you up under their thumb. So Osama bin Laden, for all of his noble causes for what he believed in, was just another latter day tyrant. And so it was proper to stand up to him and to render justice. On May 2nd, 2011, President Barack Obama went before the American people and made the announcement that people since 9-11 have been waiting to hear. No Americans. U.S. President Barack Obama announced the news of bin Laden's death late on Sunday night American time. Obama has had many defining moments as U.S. President, but this may well become the most significant. Last August, after years of painstaking work by our intelligence community, I was briefed on a possible lead to bin Laden. It was far from certain, and it took many months to run this thread to ground. I met repeatedly with my national security team as we developed more information about the possibility that we had located bin Laden hiding within a compound deep inside Pakistan. And finally, last week, I determined that we had enough intelligence to take action and authorized an operation to get Osama bin Laden and bring him to justice. Today, at my direction, the United States launched a targeted operation against that compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. A small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage and capability. No Americans were harmed. They took care to avoid civilian casualties. After a firefight, they killed Osama bin Laden and took custody of his body. The death of bin Laden marks the most significant achievement to date in our nation's effort to defeat Al Qaeda. Yet his death does not mark the end of our effort. There's no doubt that Al Qaeda will continue to pursue attacks against us. We must and we will remain vigilant at home and abroad. And on nights like this one, we can say to those families who have lost loved ones to Al Qaeda's terror, justice has been done. And tonight, let us think back to the sense of unity that prevailed on 9-11. I know that it has at times frayed Yet today's achievement is a testament to the greatness of our country and the determination of the American people. The cause of securing our country is not complete, but tonight we are once again reminded that America can do whatever we set our mind to. That is the story of our history. The president was right. That is the story of our history. And you'll note that when he said, let us think back to that period after the attack when we had that extraordinary unity. I told my students at Hope College that, you know, sometimes in the today in 2021, it seems impossible to think that we had that kind of unity. But I remember on 9-11, it didn't matter if you were male, female, Muslim, Christian, Jew, if you were Buddhist, didn't matter if you were black or white or Asian, didn't matter where you came from or language you spoke, because the people in that World Trade Center, there were people from all over the world representing so many different nationalities. Those planes flown by the terrorists attacked everybody. It wasn't just Americans under attack. It wasn't just naturalized citizens. It wasn't just native born Americans. The people who lived inside the United States who believed in American principles and ideals they were up under attack. The culture, the history, the principles, the values, and obviously the nation. And in that moment, all the things that we usually spend time allowing to separate us and divide us melted away because we realized that we had a common purpose, a common humanity, and a common enemy that, was, that wanted to do us all in. And what became important in that moment was 
being an American citizen or being in America and defeating the enemies of the United States. And on 9-11, there could be no doubt, at least we had one enemy in the world and one enemy organization in the world that had to be dealt with. We would do well to remember that in this day and time when so many people are interested in dividing us as opposed to uniting us. But time passed, as you can see from this political cartoon, we've gone through some changes since 9-11. Some people have asked a question about the strength of our democracy. Is it strong? Can it survive? January 6, 2021 certainly made many people, when you saw a mob assaulting the capital of the United States and people in the stage of inter insurrection and somebody carrying a Confederate flag inside of the Capitol, something that didn't even happen during the American Civil War, we're right to ask, what is the state of our democracy? Our democracy has been tested. Democracies are always being tested from without for sure and often from within. And people are wondering, have wondered, can it stand? People have been left dismayed and wondering about the future, worried about it. But I would like to share with us, as we close out this series, the words of Supreme Court Justice Louis, Louis D. Brandeis, who said, we have to remember, you can have, or we can have democracy in this country, or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. That's one thing to remember about the principles of democracy. But we also have to remember that tyranny never sleeps. Tyranny is not sleeping right now. Scholars of the Silver Sides, remember when all we could think about was Al Qaeda, and then all of a sudden, Al Qaeda was replaced by ISIS or ISIL, as President Obama very often said. There was ISIS in addition to Al Qaeda. There's going to always be somebody out there that wants to try and take down people who are freedom loving people. Who, who believe in individual liberty and equal opportunity, and that nations and people ought to decide for themselves how they should live, how they should worship, and enjoy things like freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and to be free from want, and to be free from fear. Echoing back to President Franklin D. Roosevelt's four freedom speeches. Because if you have the freedom of worship, then that means you live in a nation where the government it's not so paranoid about what you believe that it can't let you believe what you want to believe. And if you have freedom of speech, that means that you live in a government where the government is not so paranoid about holding on to its own power that it can't let you express yourself. And it's willing to protect your right to say with you whatever you want to say, even if it's against that government. And if you have freedom from fear, that means you live in a nation that prizes your safety and will provide the resources to maintain that safety, to include national defense, and local safety. And if you have freedom from want, that means you live in a nation that understands everybody should have the opportunity to get an education and decent, affordable jobs or wage, wage paying jobs and housing and everything else that people want in a modern society. And there's tyranny out there that wants to shut that down and it is not asleep, it has not been asleep. In the years since 9-11, we have seen that ISIS and tyranny and terrorism has sprung up in Syria as a result of this Syrian civil war, the thing that was called the Arab Spring in 2011. The Taliban continued to cause mischief and trouble in Afghanistan, in Libya. It has descended into civil war ever since the death of Muammar al-Qaddafi. Boko Haram has been on the march in Nigeria and Somalia. Al-Shabaab, another terrorist group, has been causing trouble in the Horn of Africa. So there's no shortage of people out there that want to set the world on fire. And we cannot be asleep. The United States is a global superpower, which means that we have a global footprint and we have global responsibilities. So there will always be a need, always be a need for gatekeepers, people that are standing watch on the gate looking for the horizon, looking to see who's coming, looking to, make sure, looking to maintain 
that there's no threats on the horizon. It's called national defense. It's called national security. It's called wisdom. It's called maintaining like strategic air command used to have their motto was peace through strength. We believe in peace, but we're not naive. Peace and freedom don't come naturally, not to human beings. They generally throughout humanity's long history on this planet usually have come only after some struggle because there's always somebody out there who's willing to take somebody else's peace. And the only way that that person who would have peace can maintain their peace is to be strong enough to keep their peace. So we call this series the last of the gatekeepers. Those people that have done the hard job, our world, our world, post-World War II veterans, our Korean War veterans, our wonderful Vietnam veterans, our veterans from the first Gulf War, operations Desert Storm and Desert Shield, Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Then our veterans from Afghanistan, our veterans from Operation Iraqi Freedom, and our veterans who will be coming home very soon from Afghanistan and other places around the world where we, we have been involved for so long. Benjamin Franklin said, any society that would give up a little liberty to gain a little security would desire neither and lose both. We need to remember that. We need to hold on to that. We need to celebrate our veterans. We need to give them the due that they are more than deserving of. We need to say thank you for your service always. And for those who are signing up and joining the military today and going out to basic training, they're the next generation of veterans who will stand on those gates and keep those gates and be in the watchtowers of American freedom and they will be the next ones who will make sure that everything that we value in a free nation or in a free society maintains and perpetuates and moves forward into the future. It has been a pleasure being with you these many weeks to present these subjects to you. Thank you so much for logging on. And I'm humbled by your interest and in your, in your engagement. I will now take your questions. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask any question that you would have. And there is one thing that we normally do at the end of every presentation long. We've now clapped and said thank you to Fred for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> and so that is one of the things you lose with Zoom is you don't get that little bit of interaction. But the series has been absolutely wonderful. Cliff, do you have a question? Uh, can you hear me? Is my yes, microphone working today? Oh, thank yes, you. it's working beautifully. Oh, no. I, uh, on the American spirit, uh, on, on uh, 9 11, the, the, uh, the day the towers came down, I was picking up my wife uh, who had surgery and I was picking her up at the hospital. And we were on our way home uh, when the, uh, the last tower came down. Uh, in my neighborhood, there's a Red Cross center, blood center. This is, this is a half hour after the towers came down. The, the line was around the block. Yeah. Can't do it. Yeah, Cliff. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people yes. were trying to, a lot of people, you know, were trying to figure out what can I do? And Cliff, you know, you're enough of a military historian. Cliff, you know enough, you, you know enough about this to know that, you know, immediately after Pearl Harbor, you know what a lot of men and women did? They went and they signed up. They joined the military. They signed Absolutely. up. They, they, you know, they say, you know what? My country's under attack. What can I do? Whatever I'm going to do, get into you get get in get into the process, into the the system, to do something. But standing on the sideline was not an option. And those people standing in that that that, that line at the Red Cross Center, they were doing what they could in that moment. Well said. Thank you, Fred. The whole your whole series has been great. Thanks, Cliff. I tell you what, you know, I really I really appreciate you bringing that memory. I, you know, I I didn't I didn't I didn't have my best moment on the morning of 9-11. My uh my students, when we when we went across the street to look at what was going on, and I could I could just feel rising up in me, you know, just a rage. Because all those years in the Marine Corps, you know, I mean just came right back. And my students, one of the students said, Right as class was ending, Professor Johnson, what are we gonna do? 
I said, we're going to identify these people, then we're going to find them, and then we're going to get them. Now, you were right. I used, um, I, was a much, I was much more strident, more emphatic in, in, in my statement, but essentially, that's what I said. We're going, to, we're going to identify them, we're going to find them, and then we're going to kill them. And I had to, I had to backtrack on that after a while, you know, but I was just so angry that day. I was just so very angry that my nation was under, under attack. And I, I eventually had to explain to my students you know, about the reserve center. Like there are people, I mean, the reserve system, there are people on active duty. Then there's class two people that get called, you know, back from, from the reserves to, to active duty. I said, but they get the people like me, you know, with bad knees and, you know, you know wearing out hips. Well, then that means the whole, the whole operation's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, it was quite a day. Yeah. Yes. Other question. Um, Peg? There is, um, when I think back on 9-11, I think for a long time, America as a general population wasn't even aware that we really even had a military or it was always in the background unless you actually knew someone in your family yeah. that was serving. And the constant state of readiness, because the only thing that most people hear about is this is what the military is costing. And these are the budget cuts that we have to make. And I don't think enough people understand exactly the job that the military has at all. And so those news articles and those news clips, they're so out of context, yeah. but yet, when an event like this occurs, you are so grateful that we have what we have. And um, I think that's something I wish we could let people know that each and every person in the military is there for a reason to do it. You know, uh, Fred, I, I'm glad that you emphasize the uh, job. The success. And we don't understand what those jobs are. Uh, I'm glad you emphasize the success of the uh, uh, raid uh, that, that got uh, Bin Laden. Yeah. In light of what happened with the communications failed, too many cooks spoil the soup. That's what happened in uh, the Iran That's right. uh, raid in 1980. And That's right. uh, same thing could have happened, but uh, Obama had a lot of guts to go ahead with that operation. Yeah. And fortunately, it succeeded uh, beyond anybody's uh, wildest dreams. Yeah, you're right. A lot of courage on his part to uh, go ahead. And you mentioned Sante. That was another one. That's right. That's the background of joint operations. Yes. They, uh, they, sometimes they work. Sometimes they're <laughs> big failures. But uh, he had the courage to go ahead and uh, and succeed. Yeah, you know, I, you know, Pres President Bush does not nearly get enough credit for, you know, his immediate responses. You know, people were kind of kind of poking at him, you know, for 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 being in a stun that his country was under attack. But you know, I mean, what what do people want? And, and and likewise, President Obama, you know, I'm so glad that you that you that you that you wrenched, you know, that he it took guts for him to give the green light for the operation because you know, we've been after this guy for a long time. Sure. And, and you, but you know, if you mention, if you look at Sante, Sante was executed about as flawlessly as a special op can go, but except for the fact that of course the prisoners were moved. But then you look at the the the, the, the Mayaguez operation. Mayaguez did not go well. Even though we got the shit back because just as you point out, Cliff, too many cooks or too many fingers in the pot. And then of course the, the failure at Desert One with Operation Eagle Claw. So, you know, special operations are special operations, especially a rescue or a special op like this one. We have so many different moving parts. You know, that's why they call military both an art and a science. And, you know, this uh, the, the the courage that President Obama had to had to demonstrate to give the green light to go after this, this individual that had been wanted by everybody for so long and that it worked. So it wasn't just his victory, it was our victory. There you go. Bay of Pigs was another another joint operation that uh, yeah. gave a lot of background to uh, uh, what Obama was facing when he gave the green light. That's right, that's right. You know, so the, 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 the history of those kind of operations is not necessarily one that can give one, you know, a lot of confidence as you move forward on this stuff. And, and Peg, relative to what you were saying, you know, this is why I thought it was necessary to show what happened in 1993, 1996, 1998, yes. 2000, because it was like, a, you know, once we finally get to 9-11, you go, wow, I mean, what else could it have been? Very true. 
Very true. Do we have any other questions this evening? If not, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out for our lecture series this year. And um, we look forward to having many more lecture series that are just as exciting and stimulating as this one is. If you are in the area, we encourage you to come out and visit us at the museum. We are open every day of the year, except for Christmas and New Year's and Easter. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, to walk where our veterans did, and you'll get a different feeling of it. And so I hope each and every one of you takes that opportunity to come out. We are planning to have our ser lecture series in person, but also Zoomed. So for anyone that wants to be able to come to them but can't physically make it to the museum, we'll be happy to continue that. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Birch Foundation and Blue Lake. And we are looking forward to continuing wonderful relationships with everyone. And thank you all that have supported us over the course of time. And may COVID be over soon and we can all gather back together again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Teresa. Thanks Cliff. for hosting Thanks your family. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. For now. For now. <laughs> Only a short few weeks.